I have another little snippet here um, that I thought I wanted to say this because it had something to do with Napanee Church of the Brethren, and you know that's where uh, my husband Burrow is a pastor, and uh, he's here today. Uh, I found out the woman's name, Sister Melinda Wysong, and I don't know if any people will know the last names, but she was disfellowshipped by the Napanee Church of the Brethren, disfellowshipped on September 19, 1901, for uniting with a progressive church. But Elkhart City reinstated her and took her in. So I just want you to know, wonderful grace that we had. <laughs> this fellowship down there, but hey, come on up here, right? That's what I tell those Napanee people all the time. Uh, there, was, <laughs> there was a new doctor in the small town, and it was a young woman doctor, and oh, everyone in the town really loved her. Except for old Jim Jones, he did not like to have a young woman doctor in his town. So he decided he was going to show them how she wasn't as great as they thought she was. So he went and he said, um, doctor, uh, I lost my sense of taste. The female doctor said, well, you know what you need? You need my special concoction number three. My special concoction number three. So she went and she went and got her special concoction number three and uh, she gave him a dose of it and he went, that is gross. I've cured your loss of taste. <laughs> well, he did not like being outfoxed by a, a, no, a no young woman doctor. He was, he was surely going to take care of this. And so he waited and he went back and he said, uh, uh, I have a new complaint. Oh, Mr. Jones, what is it? Well, I've lost my memory. Well, she said, I have something special for you. I have special concoction number three. I'll be, and as soon as he heard special concoction number three, out the door he ran because he remembered how bad it tastes. <laughs> she said, I guess I cured his memory loss as well. Do you remember how you came across your image of God and how you came to think of who God was. It reminds me of that joke where the little girl's drawing and the mom says, what are you drawing, honey? Oh, I'm drawing a picture of God. Well, nobody really knows what God looks like. They will when I'm finished, she says. So what is your picture of God? If you sat here and you decided you were going to draw a picture of God, or the words to articulate who God is in your life, what would that be like? So if you wrote God on a sheet and you started writing down the page of who God is, what would your responses be? How are those responses formed? You know, years ago in the early church, people couldn't read and they didn't have Bibles. And so icons became really popular and I know that we've taken them out of church, but they have a special place. The icons were there to help people articulate and understand who God was in their lives. We had icons and we had storytellers, and that's really all they knew. It was just, by, just the storytelling tradition and the icons that were created. And they were works of art that could bring us into an understanding of God. And I know you know a lot of the famous ones. I have one that is, uh, and so if we saw this and we were somewhere and we were gazing upon it, we would think that God was a beautiful comforter that loved children, that was full of love, kind. And then we have another one, the Pieta, and it's a suffering Jesus, and we remember Jesus' death and how it would be like to be a mother that was, that lost their child, and we could enter in. And that's what the icons were for. They were to bring us closer to God, to give us a better understanding who God is. And we removed them from the church, but they, they have a lot of significance. And so we still have icons now, and they don't always look exactly how we thought or how we first saw them. And so come on, some of the icons in our own community of faith, more of a personal in our personal story of faith, not in the larger part of the faith. How about that? And so when you look on that, you think all those great 
recipes that are in there and then you start to think of the people that you fellowshiped with and they made those meals. I mean, the one that I know that my family loves is the funeral casserole. The funeral casserole, we have it for every funeral dinner. And it reminds me of the saints that have gone on before. I mean, icons are to bring us into an understanding who God is in our lives. And the next one, quilting. And you see people quilting and the quilt itself. And so you look at some of these and you look at these photographs. This is a photograph. But if you had the quilt there, you could look at the quilt and remember the quilting. And it tells a story, a personal story for each and every one of us. And that's kind of what Joshua was saying today. Thanks. Joshua was saying that today. Remember. What are you going to tell your children? What are you going to tell them? What's that story we, that God just separated the Jordan River and we walked through? We're going to put some stones here and we're going to remember and it's going to trigger our memory. And we're going to tell generation after generation the wonders that you did for us in our family, in our community of God, in the kingdom of Israel. That's kind of what we're going to do today, aren't we? We're going to sit around the tables and we're going to remember the fun things that we did all those years. And I'm telling you, I love going through those archive boxes, reading those meeting minutes. It is a riot. <laughs> and some of those things you think, oh my goodness, aren't we glad we laid those down? But we have a timeline down that hallway and we have the archive table and you're going to walk along those and you're going to remember. And you're going to tell your children that are here and your grandchildren. You're going to tell them these wonderful things that maybe are personal. Maybe they lived in the same time, they were here worshiping in the same time. But your stories are going to be a little different. Your stories are going to have a little more flavor but they're going to be stories of what God was doing here. Doing here in the Elkhart City and then the Creekside Church. One and the same, all connected. And we remember God in those stories. How was God working in our lives? What was God doing? And we bring them forward and we carry them with us. Fred Craddock, was, he's a longtime pastor, gone. But he remembers when he first served a little church when he was in seminary, he said he carried this story with him for such a long time. He said this little church was a little white clapboard church out in the country. You know what I'm talking about. And they didn't have a place to baptize people in the church as we do here. And you, I'm sure you know what that was like before we had a place inside the church. When you think about it, we think um, one of the little snippets I read that they would cut a hole in the ice of the Elkhart River or the Mishawaka River, one of the rivers there, and they would baptize in the hole. Now that is dedication. Please don't ask the three pastors today <laughs> to do that because I'm, I'm not sure we would say yes. <laughs> But anyways, Fred Craddock tells this story. He tells this story about the baptisms. He said in their tradition and the, and the way that they did things at the church, it was so beautiful. He said they would go down to the river and they would make a whole day of it and they would have this big flat truck and they would have like a trailer full of food, you know, all the picnic sharings, everybody would bring it. And he said they'd get there and that flatbed truck would be the table and they'd lay the food out and they would make a big bonfire. And then in the evening is when they did the baptisms. And he said, and they would go down and they would baptize the people and they'd come up and they'd sit around the fire. And then people in the family of God there in the community would say to the new people, I am a seamstress, and if you need things mended or fixed, bring them to me. You're part of my family now. I will do them for you. And he said, the one man said, I'm a blacksmith. And see, I have to read this one. If you got any iron needs bent or straightened, that is what I got to offer you now that you're in the family. And so people would go around the circle, and they would say, you are part of our family now. 
and we want to help you in whatever you need. Isn't that what our church family does? Isn't that what the things that you remember, some of the wonderful fellowship? He said they would go around the circle and offer something out of each one of their lives. And we leave a piece of ourselves with each and every person in our community of faith. It's a beautiful thing. And he said there was always some one man, and he would get up, and he would be like the cleanup of the fire and stuff, and he'd get up. I'm re I reckon, he says, he remembers this so, so vividly. I reckon it's time to go. And so after they had a full day, they would clean up. And he said the one day he turned to him, and he said, well, Craddock, it doesn't get any better than this. When we're living in those memories, it feels so good to us, doesn't it? I mean, we remember with such warmness in our hearts and we remember such great times and the sorrows and the joys that we've shared with our families in baptism and in weddings and deaths, anniversaries, marriages. We share as a family. And our memories are like the icons. They become the icons leading us and helping us understand who God is in our lives. Our memories, when vivid, remind us of God, what God is doing and what God has done. We remember, as Joshua asked them to remember, what God has done for us. Wow, isn't that powerful? We might be tempted, though. We might be tempted to cling to the past because we love that so much. We might not want to move forward because we like that old stuff. We love those fond memories. We might be tempted to call them the good old days or the glory days. And so we have to become mindful of focusing on the present and what God is doing here. And we bring that past to here. And we see God opened up in a more clear vision, in a more understanding. We're different. Like Pastor Rosanna said in the children's message, we are not who we were at the beginning. God has brought us forward. Even though we are not worshiped together, we have something we hold that is sacred and divine mindful. We don't get stuck. I was thinking about, remember, right before they crossed over the Jordan, where were they? They were stuck. They were stuck in the wilderness because they forgot what happened right behind them. They forgot that, oh my gosh, we crossed over the Red Sea, right? Remember God had pulled back the waters there. We forgot and we got stuck in that wilderness. We were forgetting that God had saved us. God has saved us then, and God saving us. Our salvation is secure eternally, but our soul is constantly being saved and healed and restored. We have to remember that. God wants us to remember for so many reasons, but God wants them to remember before they enter in because it's not going to be easy. For them, it wasn't easy. They went into this battle right after that, and, you know, I'm not going to get into that, but... We have our own battles, don't we? Just personally, but as the community of faith, we have battles in our lives, trials and temptations that the whole community goes through. And that's part of us as well. God wants us to know that sometimes there's battles in the name of change. You know, change within us and change in our community. i got to give you another snippet. During a board meeting in 1914, Brother Cripe was called on the carpet because he was wearing a mustache without a beard. And so he had to be brought before the board at the board meeting, and they had to ask him. Well, they told him, you have to grow that beard back. And he promised he would grow back the beard, and they accepted his promise as his word. Change. How's our board meetings now? Not quite like that, is it? We're not made to do this and that. We can wear hats if we want to. Some people do not like change. And some people are convinced that it can't get any better than this. 
Some people are convinced about that. There's, in 1899, um, the director of the patent office decided that the patent office should be closed because everything that was invented had been invented. Nothing else would ever be invented again. We had seen all the adventure, inventions. And Max Born was a Nobel Prize winner in 1928 a physicist said, physics as we know it will be over in six months. These are bright people that believed that this was the best it could be. Even Thomas Watson of IBM said he could see that five computers could be used in the world. Wow, was that off the track. <laughs> they, some people think that we can't change because this is as best as it can be. And God is calling us always to a new thing. And sometimes not just a new thing, but sometimes just to a new look. The baptisms aren't cut out in the river anymore and we're not going down into that ice. But we might be going out to the pond or into the creek or at Camp Mac. See, some of those memories are sacred and need to be kept, and some of them are funny, and we laugh. And you know the differences, the baptisms and the scripture and one Lord and one God. The things that our Christian faith are grounded in, those are the things that we carry forward, and we do do new things, but some of the things we keep the same, we just do them a little differently. I saw that we had fundraisers in those meeting minutes, but our fundraisers look a little different, and I saw we have great fellowship, but that looks a little different when you call it the fish fry, right? I mean, where do you see almost everyone in the whole church that is able come and fellowship and work at the same time and then provide this beautiful hospitality to the, you know, 800 people that are coming through our doors and down our driveway. Things look different, but we change. And the Easter egg hunt, when 100 children come gleefully screaming, ah, as they take off and they open the eggs, those are memories. How we bring children to the church might look different, but we saw that icon, how Jesus loves children. We love children, too. The icons, our memories, change. But the sentiment, the Christian faith, stays the same. We have this wonderful gift of the Spirit that allows that to happen. And we lay the old stuff down, it passes away, and the new stuff comes forward in Christ. Today we sit here and we cherish those great memories. I mean, there are so many, and I hope that there are things that you have forgotten that God brings forward to you today that remind you of God in your life. Because we go forward in the future, and we need to know. It's important for us to know God in a deeper way. And as we move forward, we see God in a greater way than we saw before. Because we are changed in that way. We are a community of grace. And God is abounding in our experience now. And these are our memories for tomorrow. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for the memories that you give to us. And we thank you, Lord, that you change us. And we move and grow in your image and likeness. And in that, we see you in our living experiences right now, bringing them forward. Amen.